You know what it is. That's right. It's time to talk money with your money nerd and financial coach. Now, tighten those purse strings and open those ears. It's the Money Talk with Tiff podcast. Hey, hey, hey. Let me start moving people. Oh, good afternoon. Oh, good evening. Oh, <laughs> Good morning. Man, I read your text. <laughs> I'm like, man, God must have been on time today. <laughs> Cause uh, Lord. I'm assuming everybody on the call got that got that link filled out. <laughs> oh, for the forgiveness. All right. Yeah, definitely. They snuck that bad boy out, boy. It definitely was like ten o'clock on a Friday night. <laughs> oh, y'all talking about when they dropped the application for the student loan forgiveness. Oh, the beta. What up, what up, what up? What's up, Raquel? All right, y'all. We're going to get started in a few minutes. We're going to wait for, see if anybody else comes. And then also, my kids are being hard-headed. So I'm trying to get them in the bed. Um, so give me a few minutes. I need the energy levels in this space to be a little higher, though. All right, I got a question. I got a question. And I want y'all to know that our friendship hangs in the balance with this question. Y'all like flats or drums? I like to eat. Um, I, I used to be a drums person, but I'm more of a flats person these well, days. I and I'm like personally neither, but if I had to choose, it would be flat. Boom. I honestly for I really both. Like, like I don't think I like no, nah, I like flats. It just costs too much to try to get all flat, so you gotta eat the drums first. Or they're trying to propose it like they're doing you a favor. Oh, I can give you the flash for free. Man, is it that hard to pick out 10? Y'all yeah, silly, man. I was going to say, I like chicken. <laughs> yeah, <you know. laughs> yeah, I like chicken. I'm it's funny because as I get older and, of course, have to pay for my own food, I there, there used to be parts of the chicken like the thigh I hated growing up. But now the thigh is like the cheapest part of the chicken, and I will go and buy a pack of thighs in a second. Throw some thighs in the air fryer. Ooh. Forget about it. Listen. But you know what? About it. Are you than, fancy? You know, like thighs, you can like really do a lot with them. Like with chicken breasts, you got like only a couple of hours or a day to eat them before they start to get like dry. So I'm a like dark meat person all the way. All right. I guess now would be a good time for me to go ahead and tell y'all that I'm 29 years old and I don't know the difference between dark meat and light meat. Oh, okay. We're going to get you right though. <laughs> breasts. Breasts are going to be white meat. Thighs are going to be dark meat. So that's a quick differentiator right there. The wing. That's not neither nor or. I think the wing is like dark meat though, right? Because the leg is dark meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's dark meat. So literally when you look at the chick, like just look at the chicken the next time you take a bite out of it, like the breast is, it's whiter more kind of after and yeah legs and thighs gonna oh, be dark homie, by the time my food comes, it don't look like that and i don't cook in here so I'm, I'm at this point i just eat whatever they put my husband put on that plate and i know i'm the art bird in my family i can't cook nothing i bring the paper plates and the cups but don't ask me make nothing <laughs> all right y'all so now that we got the chicken debates out the way i'm gonna go ahead and get started so Welcome to Fin Noir, a space for Black Money Talk. We do it every Monday at 9 p.m. My name is Tiffany Grant. I am your host, and I run Money Talk with Tiff, which is a financial literacy and education platform. I love talking about money. And so we created this space to just have a space for us by us where we can just talk about things that are pressing in our community and then i also co-host with rakim sabri and i'll let you guys introduce yourself rakim sabri here i cover financial trauma and financial empowerment for people who look like me i'm an author speaker coach extraordinaire and that's it that's all i got for you guys (laughs) thank you and we'll go with melody 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Melody Wright. I am the founder and creator of Broke on Purpose. I am a financial empowerment coach, author, speaker, and also the director of financial education at the upcoming fintech called Kinley. And I work with individuals who are aimlessly broke, and I help them create strategic money plans so that they can experience financial abundance. Perfect. Thank you. And then Marquia. Hello, everybody. My name is Marquia. I'm known as the Money Plug on social media. I'm a influencer or a financial education influencer, mainly on TikTok. And I just post content educating people on some safe ways to build credit without necessarily incurring a lot of debt, debt repayment and things like that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Ronnie. Hey, what's going on, everybody? My name is Ronnie Good. I'm a CPA, tax strategist. I help business owners and investors leverage the tax code to build wealth. I'm at, at Rhythm Accounting on social media. All right, perfect. And Kamari just came in and just messed up my whole timeline here, but <laughs> we'll go to Kamari. <laughs> my apologies. Sorry for rhythming your rhythm. <laughs> you good. Go but uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Kamari Ellis. Uh, a lot of people know me as a finance rebel. I talk about all things money, especially as it relates to the Black people and our struggle. Perfect. Thank you. All right. I have Stephen next. Hey, everybody. My name is Stephen Stack. I do financial consulting, coaching, and my really my rhythm is I try to help people build wealth, but I always believe wealth goes beyond just what's in our bank account to the person we're becoming. I do have personal receipts. I made my first million at age 31 and just try to help people build the foundations to build wealth all the way up to actually the actual act of doing the wealth itself. Perfect. Perfect. And then we have Jonathan. Hey, good evening, everyone. This is Jonathan Thomas. I help people build wealth. Also, and in conjunction, I help you actually leverage the bank products, educate you on the bank products and how the bank can be more of a partner in your path to building wealth. All right. Perfect. Thank you. So as you can see, we have a bomb squad of hosts and co-hosts and speakers here to talk about this topic. Now, I threw the topic up there. Rakim actually made a post about a day ago and he asked, in case you're listening on the podcast, how do y'all feel about the terms minority and people of color and we thought that this would be a wonderful topic to stick on tonight because everybody has different conceptions views things like that so this would just be a bomb conversation to have and especially because these terms are always thrown around very very loosely to start us off i'm gonna go straight to the source (laughs) rakim how do you feel about the terms minority and people of color so i used to and sometimes i still by by force of habit use the terms to be politically correct and I think most people these days do but I think it's important to distinguish black people and their struggle and our struggle specifically from the group of POC and minority what I'm finding as respectability politics makes its rounds is that the term minority really includes everybody but your cis hetero white man and the term poc includes it just lumps everybody struggling together and so the issue that i have with that is that it dilutes the struggle that black people specifically have in this country and around the world as it relates to and we're talking about money as it relates to money so when we talk about opportunities through grants, opportunities through programs that quote unquote give back the initiatives that some of these large corporations put on their their marketing around outreach and diversity, equity, and inclusion. It can check off the box of satisfying this criteria without actually giving to the black community specifically. So I have a not positive relationship with those terms as time progresses and I'm working on not removing them from my vocabulary, but being more tactical in the way that I use those terms. Even when I talk about my opening, right, I create content around financial trauma and financial empowerment for people who look like me 
there's a very clear audience there and that I think that intentionality is key. Yes, definitely understand that. And Marquia, I see you got your hand raised. I have a question. So I recently started reading or well, rereading Uncle Marketing. So I'm working on my marketing message. And for so long, mine was I had black people. Like it specifically said black communities in my marketing message. And as I, because I'm, I'm an influencer, right? Sometimes I get brand deals or I get approached by brands or stuff like that. And it was like, I guess when I was putting black people, it made them uncomfortable. And so for me, I, that was one of those things where I was like, you know what? I'm going to just change change it because you get what I'm saying I wanted that money so it, and I felt like in my head I was rationalizing it I'm not necessarily taking it out I'm just changing how it sounds because I feel like with the whole all lives matter black lives matter thing it made it a lot harder for me to I don't know I guess it made me a little uncomfortable saying it in certain situations because I knew they would take it the wrong way and I felt like it would instantly eliminate me from certain opportunities or it would instantly cheapen the message that I was trying to convey. Right, Kim, my question to you is, you know, how, what was the moment where you was like, yo, I'm not doing this no more. I don't need to, I should not have to, and I'm okay with walking away from opportunities because of it. A good question. I think in full transparency, I actually haven't crossed that bridge yet, right? So I still have, I guess the word would be trepidation around marketing myself that way. And when I first started in like personal branding, I was very clear to use more general and more broad terms when I would speak about my content and then just sneak in the anecdotes that that black people specifically would relate to. And I don't know at what point it was during this year, the different conferences that I was hopping in between, but I realized that there is power in niching down and there's power in clarity, right? So if I'm clear about who my messaging is directed towards, there's no confusion. I think also what kind of gives me peace in this is that just because my content is created with Black people in mind or for Black people doesn't mean that non-Black people can't benefit from it. And so what I've seen in the mixed audiences that I engage is that there is a positive, there's more of a positive in that I'm highlighting the issues of Black struggles, particularly as it relates to money, for Black people to have conversations around, right? But also it's like a light bulb for non-Black people who don't know about the struggles or who pretend not to know about the struggles that we experience financially and the barriers that we have to navigate in order to be successful. Long answer, but I think as you are embarking on this marketing journey, like to keep that in mind, I know you specifically were a really big fan of the, uh, the clip that I shared recently from this last conference that I went to where I said that there are those of us who are not looking to infiltrate your spaces, but to create our own. And that was very much unplanned, unscripted, right? Somebody just threw a curveball and I responded. But I think as I look back on that statement and the impact of that statement as being, and just to set the lay of the land for you guys, the only Black man in that room, it was a large room, the only Black man in that room and, the, and one of two Black people present that it was kind of like, whoa, you said that. Whoa, you went there. But the response that I got afterwards was one of respect. And so I think standing on your square and just making it clear, this is who my audience is, but if you benefit from my content, great. I'm not excluding you, but this is who I'm talking to. Yeah, it's, and I'm sorry if I'm jumping in, but one thing that I think often gets missed because the content world and when you're creating reels and when you're creating all these different messaging, it's open to everybody, right? It's like people are walking past a door in a hallway of a school. And oftentimes the people who do respond or if someone may go in and take offense, people don't, by nature, I don't have the stats, but just in my interactions and even in corporate, one of the things that really set me apart as a leader is because I always used to catch people like, hey, you're not assuming positive intent. When I talk to somebody, I assume first that they meant they, something positive by the message or what they were doing. And then I'll look for behaviors and actions after it to reinforce that. And if I can't find them, then I'll allow myself to hold them accountable. But the same thing with our messaging out here, that if someone comes to you, Marquis or Rakim, my thing is 
you market and you're speaking to a specific subset of individuals. Ideally, the people who are coming to you that want to do the sponsorship, brand deals, all those different things, my thinking is you want to talk to those people too. <laughs> it's not to alienate, but this message, this product is for them and it tailors and aligns with this message. Not to say that somebody from another nationality can't have a good use for that same product or service. It's just saying, hey, when I created, this is who I was going after. And oftentimes, again, the assuming positive intent, I don't believe everyone approaches information that way. They usually look for, get on the defensive because they were automatically offended because it wasn't directed at them. All right. And then Stephen, you had your hand raised first. Yeah, I yeah. So I'll go to the original question and then try to just react to some of the things I heard. How I feel about the terms minority or people of color. I'm I don't have a harsh feeling to, towards either. I always try to take it in context of who I'm talking to, who I'm listening to. Where there'll be more of a rub for me is when if there's dollars being considered to be distributed out, particularly as it relates to Black people, wanting to make sure that there is clarity in the messaging of how it's going to be sent out. And Rakim had made a statement, which is really true when you start thinking about whether it be commercially, corporately, so on and so forth. When you say minority, that could just be women. That could be someone's sexual orientation. It could be ethnic. There's a lot of different directions to go. So I'm always wanting to be clear on what do we mean when we say that? And then obviously people of color can be the same thing of just different ethnicities. So I'm normally really pointed about it when trying to figure out, okay, what is trying to be solved here? What people group potentially is trying to be uplifted. As far as creating content, I think a great point was made by Jonathan of typically if I'm making content, I'm talking to people that are similar to me as far as my ethnic background, how I've come up, just what my experiences have been. I've got kind of a view of who I'm talking to, but it's all, it's universal truths or it's things that they work across the board uh, when talking about finance, but I just try to take the lens of what my life experiences have been and people that I've been able to see and hear their stories and clients that I've been able to work with and speak in that way in the language of the people that I'm typically around. So those are just my quick thoughts, but I want to hear from some, from some other people too. Thank you, Stephen. I'll just say, going back to the original question, I rarely use minority, honestly, especially because it's a myth that Black people are the minority all over. We're worldwide, okay? So I rarely use it when speaking about us, that's for sure. People of color, I do use when I'm talking about all ethnicities. And when I say all ethnicities, pretty much other than white. So like when I'm trying to include Black, Brown, Asian, stuff like that, then I'll go ahead and use people of color. Now for my brand personally, I always say I'm out here for Black and Brown communities. And I do include our Brown brothers and sisters because in some statistics, they're actually doing worse than us as Black people. So I do include them in my messaging and how I position my brand is that it's for Black and Brown communities. And that's what I have in like my bio and all that stuff. I'm very pointed about that. And like Kim said, even though it's made for those demographics, I mean, I still have people, white people that follow me and love my content and stuff like that. That stuff doesn't matter, but I just want it to be clear that this is who I'm speaking to. So I always use black and brown communities and that's usually how I position myself. That's my thoughts around that. I rarely use minority. Sometimes I use people of color, but most of the time I say black and brown communities. All right, Rakim. I'm going to actually go, go next because I spoke already and I want to keep us honest with the time. Okay. Well, thank you, Anthony. 
Hey, good evening. So the topic as far as minority and people of color, I agree with everyone else on this. As far as minority, it just depends on the demographic of what you're talking about. By definition, I know Kamari is big on definitions. And then when you talk about people of color, I it really depends on the topic. I try not to talk about color when it comes to money, because most of us have money problems or the way how we handle money is a little different, but unless I'm talking about different communities. But I did think about it as far as a marketing standpoint is that people of color makes it a lot easier to search. So I mean, some of you might know for Sam's Delcine's Black Real Estate Dialogue. When you search Black Finance podcasts, Tiffany, your show actually shows up. And it's like, it's easier to search when you're looking for key terms. So it's great for that, as far as creating content. But as far as an everyday conversation, it is something that I try not to use when it comes to money. But that's just me personally. So I, I think that's a really interesting kind of position. And I was going to bring up a series of tweets that actually... Marquia was entangled in earlier, but I will bring that up, but I just want to massage that thought a little bit more in tandem with this idea. So when we're, when we're talking about money, I think the biggest miss in financial education today is that we don't include the nuance of, and I'll use the word color for the sake of context, but really it's around culture, right? That then strips the conversation from what systemic and structural barriers look like from what mistrust looks like for the financial institutions and the financial industry for financial educators as a whole. And then it kind of perpetuates this cycle around how we teach financial education and how we are taught financial education, particularly as black people. And I think that that creates more harm. And you guys know that financial trauma is my thing. I think that it creates financial trauma because we're pretending or it's almost as if we're pretending in the messaging that these things don't exist and that people can go out there and bootstrap their way into success. It's not to say that the limitations that exist are barriers that we cannot navigate through or around, but I think that especially as I mature in the content that I deliver, it's very important for us to acknowledge the nuance and say, okay, this is where we are. These are what the barriers look like. Here's a roadmap for what navigation around those barriers look like because pretending that they don't exist doesn't eliminate them. And so to to the the tweet threads that Martik Marquia was entangled in, I thought it was really interesting how I was looking through the quote tweets and Marquia, you can give more insight into this if necessary. There were a lot of black people Black men specifically, who were taking the words from her statement, her thread around really just having this idea that financial education for Black people needs to come from Black people and saying that, oh, so now we're conflating credit card debt with Black trauma. And it's, you're oversimplifying the point. And so, you know, I didn't engage in any of these tweets because I had to protect my peace. But I think that since we're having this conversation right now around these terms, POC, minority, Black, in relation to financial education and the impact of culture on financial education, that I'm interested to to have some dialogue around that. Thank you, Rakim. I want to go to Mowoli, and I might have butchered that, so I apologize. Please correct me. Um, but go ahead. No, you're good. Mowoli, Bodhi, financially present. Thank you, Tiffany and Rakim. Um, thank you all. In regards to the original tweet or the question, now that I think about it more, I wouldn't say that I prefer one over the other, but I feel like they're both ambiguous, and at times they can take away from what we all can offer. But that at the same time, it, it's so necessary. And I know for some of the language that I share or use and maybe like for marketing purposes, I may prefer minority versus people of color, although the target audience is black and brown people. And But when you dive deeper or when you hear me tell my story, you're going to hear that, hey, as the only black person in the brokerage office, you could stand up, say hi to someone and they walk right past you 
and go to the white person or the Asian person because that very much so happened. And uh, excuse me. And so as I think of it, anytime I tell my story, it's you're going to hear it and understand what perspective it's coming from and who it's intended for, despite some of my white clients or white colleagues and things like that. And, and I had a lot of white colleagues that, that helped me in that space, but it actually takes me a little bit back to last week where someone, and if you mentioned it, feel free to jump in. <laughs> you mentioned about the space that we're in and taking up space. And that's, at least that's how I interpreted it. But it is important that even if we don't belong in specific spaces, we take up that space and and maybe I'm digressing, but as far as the two terms, whether it's minority or people of color, there is an ambiguous nature. But I think as we dig into to the stories, your target audience will know that it's you. But there is an, another level of practicality of specifically saying black, specifically saying brown. So I definitely see your part of the wrestle that Marquia mentioned as well. Yeah. Thank you for that. We actually love a good digress. And that was a good digression. <laughs> Definitely take up space, show up who, as you are, who you are, and be proud of that because we are awesome. Anyway, I wanted to go to Kamari because he had his hand up first. Let's see. I'm trying to remember what I wrote the other day. Rocky, I'm going to ask this question. So context matters depending upon it. What I feel like POC and minority are whitewashing of black oftentimes and I feel at least for me I feel like I intensely want to say black because I always want to tie it back into the history and everything that was done to us from a racial perspective was done because of race and color whether it's redlining whether it's black gold whether it's reconstruction shoot I'm trying to think of if we look at affirmative action Right, which originally was championed for by black folks. We wind up not even being the majority participants or recipients of the monies that were allocated in that scenario. And so I feel oftentimes we get lumped in to minority or POC and nobody cares about us. And it especially infuriates me when black folks do it. Because I'm like, are you even cognizant of what's going on here? Because once you change the narrative and the language, all the dollars will flow that way. And so we're not intentional with our language. I think it's really, really important to be conscious of that. And now I'm not, I'm not, I am not oblivious to the fact that sometimes if you label yourself as black, people will look at you as the angry black man or woman. Plenty of times people will come on my lives on YouTube or watch some of my replays on YouTube and say, oh, I was here for the knowledge until you said you like black wealth or it's for the black community. As if they couldn't learn from my knowledge over wall. And I just kind of take it in stride or take it in stride rather. But that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I have seen that also, especially in the Twitter space, because I've been very, very active on Twitter and apparently I ruffle a lot of feathers and it always brings out those types of people for some reason. But anyway, I digress and that wasn't going to be a good digression. So we'll go to Marquia. <laughs> and what Rock Kim was talking about with that tweet thread, that's one of the reasons why I was one of those people's bro. I'm not even about to just I'm not even about to put it in there because they literally ignored every point that I made as soon as they read black or as soon as I mentioned my blackness. And I got so tired of the messages that I was trying to convey and the information that I was trying to put out be diminished to, oh, she's making it about race again. Oh, do black people have a monopoly on credit card debt? I got so tired of the things that I was trying to say being diminished just to that. But like on the same, the other side of that coin is now I feel like, I guess so is a very strong word, but now I feel like I did exactly what they wanted me to do. Like they wanted me to stop mentioning my blackness in these spaces and in these conversations because it makes them uncomfortable. And I did exactly that. So it's, I don't know. I feel like it's like one of those. Yes, of course, I believe because I feel like what everybody's saying, like my content, when I'm putting it out, 
you can clearly tell I'm talking about black people and the black experience, but there's something that I'm not overtly saying. And a part of me as a financial education influencer, especially a part of me wants to be like, and wants to stand on that and be like, nah, I said black people, but do, do I want to keep having this conversation? Do I want to keep having this argument about how my point is still valid, no matter what I'm talking about, if, if I'm including my blackness in this conversation, that does not mean that my point is irrelevant. Do I want to keep having that conversation? Like, how do you make that decision? Oh, can I just jump in? Yeah, go right ahead. Your okay. turn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is why I am so passionate about us doing or really becoming masters at whatever our crafts are and running up the bag is because you just will ignore the noise. So y'all haven't seen me. Some of y'all have seen me on social media for a while. Some of you, I got to meet you within the past month, but I can just tell you one thing you will never see me do is argue with somebody on social media. Cause I'm like, nah, I'm actually doing well in real life. I'll let y'all figure it out. Like y'all can argue. I may comment from an engagement standpoint to the degree that I understand how that may work on like an Instagram. But if y'all watch me closely, I said what I said, I meant it. And I won't let people tie me up into the nonsense. And now part of this is just, that's just always been who I am. So I really don't like to associate that with my financial standing. It just magnified it. It bolstered it. And one thing I did want to say of why it is important to be specific is because much of the reason why we're in the space that we're in is because the negatives were specifically targeted at us. Whether it be phrenology and head skull measurements or what our chest measurements were to say that we were going to be extinct instead of paying attention to the fact that we were malnourished during slavery. People are likely familiar with things like redlining of how, whether it was being insurable or getting a good quality loan or what the appreciation was going to be in certain areas of town, the African was at the bottom very intentionally. And Make no mistake that when there is ambiguity around a smaller numbered amount of people, whether it be ethnically or the makeup is, if it's ambiguous, the money does not flow to black people. That's just typically how these things play out historically and unfortunately even to this day unless it's very pointed it the it typically doesn't flow beneficially our way so i just want to encourage you marquia yeah. ignore them you, you know what i mean i know it may be hard say what you mean speak to us if that's who you're speaking to and you want to use black and they want to say, oh, well, why are you saying that? I promise you, just ignore it. Like, you can just not respond and keep tweet tweeting, posting, commenting, because they want you to react to them, to get you down a rabbit trail, get you flustered, get you frustrated off of, really off of where it is that you want to be. And they're not going to help you get where you want to go versus the stuff that at least when I'll get on social media and see many of the things that you share, it's thoughtful. It's helpful. I can tell you've, you, you've waited before putting it up there and I don't have to just have good intentions to see that. I can see what you're posting and don't let these bad actors get you off your mission. Now, okay. Thank you, Steven. I'm going to say I do 
engage, but I'm an educator. I love teaching people. So if I do choose to engage with my comments, because I don't engage with everybody, but if I do choose, I do it with intentionality and I do it to teach. And so usually I'm coming with fact, figures, and data, and you can't argue those. So a lot of times when I do have those trolls or whatever coming in my tweets and commenting and stuff, I hit them with facts and I hit them with figures. And most of the time they back down because you can't argue with that. But even if I have some that are just cool with being ignorant, I just start ignoring them. But what I've noticed is in those educational moments, there are other people reading those comments and they're like, oh, I didn't think about it this way. Or they're at on a different point. And it just keeps, a, what am I trying to say? Like a intelligent conversation flowing, regardless of the bad actor that started it, if that makes sense. So I do engage at times, but it's always intentional. And I always cut it off if I need to, because I do protect my peace. <laughs> yeah, it- And I should have clarified of when it's clear that they are being a troll or a bad actor that I just keep pushing right past where people are going with that nonsense. Absolutely. And then. Yeah. I want to add to this too, because I I just listening to Marquis. I I can relate. So I get in trouble on Twitter like every other week. So I'm, this is familiar territory for me. Wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on. Every other week, or every other day. And uh, and I have a provocative teaching style. So I know a lot of times that when I'm putting something out there that people are either going to love it or they're going to hate it. I think my most, my, my biggest, like, in trouble, if you can call it that, was a couple months ago when I had tweeted that Malcolm X was a capitalist. And I've never seen engagement like I've seen on that tweet and I didn't even get the opportunity to like defend myself, to defend my position, or rather I didn't take the opportunity because people were so offended by me making that statement that it was just an attack. Like I had to turn off the comments. And so I said all that to say to you, Marquia, that and to anybody else who might be struggling in this space, that social media is definitely a game and Twitter is ruthless. People are waiting to hit you with the gotcha moment and so you can decide at that point how you want to move forward and I shared this with you earlier but I'm going to reiterate it you have so much good stuff whether that's your email list whether that's your TikToks whether that's whatever that you can use this expanded exposure to plug up and so we were talking about credit in this thread And your branding is all around credit. So I was just like, man, this is a really good opportunity for you to shine and plug up your stuff. So I think there's something to be said about protecting your peace. There's something to be said about living in your truth, right? To Stephen's point. But there's also something to be said about playing this marketing game that you're talking about and using the exposure to plug up your products and and plug up your insights so that you can control the flow of that attention because not everybody is going to be on the same page as you, but the people who get it, get it, right? The people who are your tribe, the people who are going to subscribe to whatever it is that you put out there are going to subscribe. And that's really the point. That's why we're here, right? To get eyes on our stuff. So I would just say, stay encouraged. I take it deeply, deeply personally when somebody suggests that I am being inauthentic or that I'm doing something outside of the realm of integrity. So I get it. But to both Stephen and Tiffany's point, you just got to block out the noise. Yes, engage with intention. All right, and then I think Kamari had his hand up first. So the other day when this was happening, I kind of told y'all or suggested to y'all, don't even feed into some of these trolls, right? Because a lot of times they have no goal, they have no purpose, they have no life. And then we'll get all emotionally involved. And then they'll go on about their happy way. And then it's like, what do we get out of this? And that comes from an experience I had. I don't know if anybody is familiar with the Mummers in Philadelphia. They do a parade every year. And they love to parade in blackface. They've been warned about it. They still do it a lot of times. And one year, it happened about two years in a row. And I 
commented on it on Facebook. And then for somehow the whole mummers section attacked me on my Facebook page. And I was going back and forth with them over this. And this happened for, like I said, about two years. And then what happened was I was able to write an op-ed for the city paper, which is the Philadelphia Inquirer here. But what I learned from that is instead of just going back and forth with people, create content. Because at least the content will last way longer than your comment will. And you'll get more out of it. It becomes an asset for you. And if you really want to stand on something and put it out to the world, we're all content creators here. Create content around it. And I'm not trying to suggest in police and tell y'all what to say and what not to say. But I'll just say this. A lot of these people really don't care about you. And so don't put that energy into them. They don't care at all. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Kamari. And then Jonathan? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> a lot was said, but the one thing that going back to, I think Stephen was speaking and it triggered a thought of the reason why he's so passionate about this speaking. And yeah, I never answered the question. Truth be told, I didn't, it wasn't favorable to me when the terms were coming out, only because the way I took the information in was simply back in the 1950 years when segregation was happening, it seemed like everybody was trying to look at things as black and white. And throughout many different instances, and I know this was mentioned through many of you guys, so sorry for restating, the whole purpose of the importance of being able to define, hey, this is how this person identifies. Well, you took people of color, you took Black people, and now you try to lump that, like many of you have already stated, hey, this person wants to be identified as he or she, and we got LGBTQ, which is nothing wrong with how everyone is identified. But the point is, you're lumping groups of people together with different nationalities for the sake of just putting a stamp on it. So that was one just for that question. And then the second thing, was to the thought that was triggered was, when, you, when I decided I wanted to build wealth, the second thing I realized, and even when I wanted to go into leadership in corporate America, I realized, hey, there's going to be backlash because I'm not working for a lot of African-American people who even identify with my background. I, the same thing is with wealth. There's not a lot of African-American people, who Black people, who have wealth in this country. But the idea that I was thinking was, if you ever want to impact it's going to come with conflict because traditionally we didn't have wealth. If we had more wealth in this country, if we had more wealth, what does that do? Well, that now gives you the tool being money until the tool changes that you can influence heavily elections. You can influence who's in that. You can influence what laws are passed and how those laws will now influence the culture. So you can have real impact. And so when you talk about the importance of identifying all these different things truth be told yeah i can teach people all about wealth like many of you stated but the fact is if you're an asian person and we walk the same career path i guarantee you you're not going to have the same challenges that i've had <laughs> and still have thank you thank you and i'm actually going to find this tweet that i just posted the other day that actually looked at so I kept the age, the education, everything the same except for race. And it showed what the income disparities were. So I'm going to find that tweet and put it up there. But if there's anyone that's listening that wants to comment on this topic, we're talking about how do you all feel about the terms minority and people of color, please raise your hand and we'll pop you up on the speaker stage. So that way you can let us know how you feel about that. Also, did anyone else have any comments about this topic? That's already on the speaker stage. I'm Mark- I just, <laughs> I guess you can say ironic, almost in a sense. I mean, we've had these conversations offline about people in the marketing space specifically. And they always tell you to be your authentic self and fuck what other people say and da 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 And then you sit back and you take stock, like she said, and you 
start taking some of the similarities away and look at what makes you different. And it's always race. Gary Vee talks about being your authentic self and how, oh, you can always be yourself. You can always be yourself. You don't got a code switch. But then if you look at our community specifically, it is we are so indoctrinated at such a young age to code switch that one, a lot of times we don't realize we're doing it. And two, it had become the standard even for us. So even when we think we're being our authentic selves and we think that you know, we're being true to who we are, in reality, we're not because we're still having to have these conversations about, well, I don't want to say this because I don't want to make people uncomfortable. And oh, I don't want to say that because they might look at me. For example, when I got my locks, I was still in the military. There was a point in time when they were kicking people out for having locks in the military. When that law changed, I was one of the first soldiers on the whole, I was on a training installation to get them. When I tell y'all, they talked about me like a dog. I couldn't even go get lunch at the defect because I was getting smoked, which is when they make you do push-ups because of my hair. All because it made them uncomfortable. It was a different situation. They didn't know how to handle it. And so it had got to a point where I was looking at, oh, wigs or something to throw on top of my hair. And it's just so crazy to me just sitting here listening to everybody talking because I should be proud of what I do. Me being black is why I do what I do. But there was still that little part of me that was like, nah, man, I can't. I don't want to. I don't want to make them uncomfortable. I really don't want to make this awkward or I don't want to have to keep explaining myself. And it's just, I don't know. I just thought that was, I really wanted to point that out because it was something that was just sitting on my heart just now. But it's just crazy how even in trying to be authentic, we are so ingrained to believe that we are not authentic or we don't matter or we have to diminish ourselves to matter. I just think that's so crazy. Can I say something real quick? Go ahead. I'm a big Lena Waite fan. She's the creator of the Shy and Queen and Queen of Slim. And Marquia just brought me back to a time when she was making Queen of Slim. And she was doing her press run. And then Subject of Code Switching came out. And she refused to code switch. She talks to the studio execs the same way. And she's like, oh, listen, if I'm going to be authentically myself, they got to get this sign. And so I felt that in my total being. Like, if we're really going to be about liberation, empowerment, and wealth, and we do it in any other way than Black, then it's just another form, another formula, or another output for white supremacy. I completely agree. And honestly, I think I've said this before, but I always show up authentically, regardless of the space, regardless of the audience, because at the end of the day, I'm me, and I'm not going to be uncomfortable on behalf of someone else. If they decide that they want to be uncomfortable because of what I say or who I am or how my hair is, then that's on them. That's not on me, and we don't have to take that on as individuals. That's not my issue. (laughs) That's not my issue. So anyway, I want to go to Anthony because he had his hand raised. Yeah, when it comes to everybody... Well, I don't say everybody, but you hear the term, if they don't allow you to sit at the table, build your own table, or you bring your own table and sit wherever. It's a lot of times people don't have that foundation to build the table on, and that's usually the case. So we have to close switch to at least get a seat at the table to be part of those conversations to then know how in the world they build the table in the first place, but also have that ability to understand or the will to deal with the backlash or deal with the rhetoric or being closed off or not having certain opportunities because you want to be like your authentic self. And it's almost like to each their own, but also it's like, how do we encourage to be yourself in an environment that will allow you to be yourself when the environment or the systems that are set up are set for you to not be yourself. But yet everybody glorifies it and to some degree. It's almost like a double-edged sword, and that's why I always go back and forth on, on that particular topic of being yourself. And sorry that you had to go through what you had to go through, Marquia, but it's, it's tough. And I'm sorry for everybody. I'm sure we all had to go through certain situations like that growing up in our community. But how do we, where we are today, try to reach those who are actually coming out to then provide them a space to be themselves 
but not just a space, but also when they go out into the world to continue to be themselves regardless of the the attacks that come towards them so they can stand on their own. I know I got questions because I don't have the solutions. I yield my mic at this point. Thank you, Anthony. And I'll just say to answer your question real quick before we go to Renita, we have to show up authentically first. I notice like as I show up authentically, it makes more and more people show up authentically. And so it kind of creates a, a, a chain reaction. But if they don't see somebody being an example and doing that, then what are they supposed to look up to? And I say that humbly. <laughs> For instance, when I was in corporate America, I was in high level HR positions. I still came in with my waist speed showing, my African garb, my locks flowing, all that good stuff. And what it did was all the other people that looked like me in the company that saw me on a daily basis, they're like, oh, well, if Tiffany can just be herself, she can have her locks, maybe I'll go get my locks now. You know what I'm saying? So it started a chain reaction. So in my opinion, we have to be the change that we want to see. And even it's showing in my kids as well. Like my son, he goes to school however he wants to look. And I'm sometimes like, you sure you want to wear that? That's how it is. He's, I'm good. <laughs> and I'm like, by all means, go right ahead. As we are the examples, then other people will look at us as well and say you know what if they can do it I can do it too all right let's go to Renita hey guys I'm digging this conversation full disclosure I'm a journalist I haven't worked with any marketing companies any brands I haven't done any brand marketing yet but honestly my hope is that our businesses, because we're being true to ourselves and we're talking directly to our audiences whoever that may be that our businesses in this group are thriving so much that if a brand doesn't want us to say black or do something specific, then you can simply choose not to. I think that's why going back to the core concepts of wealth building, right? That's why it's even more important for us to double down on the things that we can do during this downturn to increase our bags so that then we don't have to rely on the brands. Marquia, I'm so sorry that you experienced that, but what I'm looking forward to is the day that you can simply decide, oh, they don't want to do this. Oh, I'm good. One thing that I can relate to is using the term black over people of color or maybe in tandem with it. So I used to host a show that was very specific to black businesses. And so when people pitched me the minority line, when people pitched me the people of color line, my standard was, does this involve a black executive or business owner or does it do something good for black folks? <laughs> and so if it didn't, then I didn't try to twist and turn the pitch for them to make it work. And that was a decision that I had to come to make. It was some trial and error as to how I was able to make it. But it was a decision because I'm like, the name of this thing has black in it. Come on, people. Now, a few times I did do, get this, black and other people of color. <laughs> That's what I did. But I definitely put black first. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that. <laughs> that is funny. Raquel. Yeah, I just want to do a time check. It's that we're at the hour. Sorry to anybody that wants to talk after me, but I'm going to be the last one. But the couple of points that I wanted to that I wanted to make, I just kind of wrote down. First off, my dad and I learn a lot from him. So we talk often. And one of the things that he said to me that I've echoed is that some of the biggest white supremacists are black people. And I just want to let that breathe for a second. So some of the biggest upholders of white supremacy are black people and i know that's a different conversation for a different day but as we navigate this space i think it's important as educators who are passionate about educating our people that we keep that at the forefront anthony made an inquiry into like how do you enter these spaces and decide how to navigate how to move and i think for me what that looks like is deciding who you want to be 
And that doesn't have to be radical. So I think a lot of times black people, when we take a hard stance against the system, that we feel like that hard stance has to be very radical, very like keyboard revolutionary. And that's not true. So deciding who you want to be and what that looks like is important. And and then just personal anecdote, I'm still navigating the migration from the code switching and the years and years and years of code switching that existed in corporate America to just figuring out who it is that I want to be. And even in listening back to some of these talks or the TikTok videos that I create versus the way that I sound in certain arenas around pre- presentations, I can tell like there's still a reflex that exists in that code switching. And so I think, I don't know what the solve for that is, but allowing yourself the space to grow and morph and change and maybe take the things that worked and get rid of the things that didn't is also important. So I just want to go back to this idea of grace, not only for other Black people, but for ourselves as we figure out this identity that we want to adopt. That's it. Thank you so much. Really quick, did anybody want to add on anything else before we wrap up? I know Rakim said nobody else could talk, but sorry. It's so funny. Wow. But is there anyone that can that wants to share really quickly as we wrap up? Because I don't want to mute anybody either. So just last call. I would just say dive into your history. This isn't new. We've always had to deal with this. I just shared a video with Toni Morrison and people talking to her and asking her when is she going to write white folks and her response was stellar so check that out that's in the group and i think we need to carry tony's spirit and our ancestors spirit with us wherever we can awesome thank you so much so with that being said i guess we'll go ahead and wrap up we end it on time tonight Woo woo! but this was a great conversation and i just want you all to make sure that you're following Everybody up here, all of the hosts, co-hosts, speakers, and everybody in this room, really, because we all apparently have the same ideas. Well, same but different. (laughs) You know what I mean? We all are trying to better our community. And so that's what's important. So it's great to connect with like-minded individuals. And I appreciate you all joining this space. We do this every Monday night at 9 p.m. We talk about different things regarding to the black struggle and yes black money talk (laughs) is very specific and so thank you so much for joining us tonight and i hope you all have a rest wonderful rest of your night bye thank you for listening joining and being a part of the money talk with tiff podcast this week you can check tiff out every thursday for a new money talk podcast but if you just can't wait until next week you can listen to previous podcast episodes at moneytalkwitht.com or follow Tiff on all social media platforms at Money Talk with T. Until next time, spend wise by spending less than you make. A word to the money wise is always sufficient.